Thank <laughs> you. 
Lincoln Center Tower houses just courthouse and judicial government center, general government functions only or both, general government and judicial. <laughs> site 
with a new parking garage for the judicial center and then to have the administration building be in another location location is not determined whether it's making road or whether it's somewhere else downtown that has not been decided a lot of places we've had in public meetings um, with the citizens there are a lot of suggestions on where that building would be or could be but nothing has been really talked about with council specifically <coughs> and then again an at grade or on grade parking facility for a new administration building at another site and then option four would be a complete new site for all facilities a new judicial center a parking structure and an admin building on a different site not on this site what would happen to this site again it has not been determined whether we sell this site whether we use it for something completely different but part of option four is to move the government center judicial and administration to a completely different site so before we vote I'm going to go back kind of through these four options real quick and then we'll take a vote so again option one is existing site to leave the tower renovate the tower demolish the two wings and the parking structure with a judicial center and a parking structure on this existing site option two is completely demolish this building, the wings, the parking structure, new facilities on this site, an admin building and a judicial center as well as a parking garage. Option three, complete demolish of all three structures, the parking garage, the wings, um, and the tower to um, have the new judicial center and parking structure on this site and to move the administration building uh, to a different site. And then option four would be to move the judicial center and the admin building off of this site on into another location. So does anybody have any questions before we just hear what your preference is? The first one would be to um, demolish the two wings in the parking garage to build a new judicial center based on this side of the, of the um, parcel. Um, to build a new uh, parking structure and to gut this building and renovate it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, the size of the building will be determined through this, the um, cost for, the, through the study that they do. So um, the size of the building has yet to be determined. So whether it's on this site or a different site, the size will definitely be based on the needs for today moving forward. Any other? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. And that, that's a huge thing that people should consider. And I don't know if everyone can hear what the sheriff's comments were, but whether, depending on which option is chosen, will also determine the cost. Because obviously, if we have to gut and renovate this building, that means everyone has to be out of the building. So there is a cost to that. Relocating all of the employees that are in this building somewhere else while that renovation is going on. So that is part of what the consultants will be providing, not only as a timeline, but uh, the logistics of each of those options. Any, yes, Carolina. Uh, again, the site has not been determined, and obviously those kind of things would have to be considered when picking a site.
Any other questions? And that has been discussed and that will be some of the things that the consultant will consider and what their proposal could be. Um, preliminary discussion has been to make two separate buildings, a judicial center and administration building. And again, that would allow for the height not to have to be the way it is currently. So that is part of the discussion as well. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, which would be the most cost effective for the city of Columbus, would it be option four possibly with building a new site and then leaving this site when the new sites are finished? And that, that's something that we'll get um, preliminary information on when they, when they go through, when the consultant goes through and determines the space needs, determines the logistics and what it will take, they will assign costs to each one of those options. So again, we're asking if costs were no option, what would you prefer? And then the plan is after we get the cost proposals back, your selection, your preference might change because if one is twice as much as the other one, you're like, well, maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe I'm okay with this. So that was something that we talked about when we went out to public meetings with the citizens as well is make your decision now based on if we have an open pocketbook. But obviously, we'll come back out after we get the results back from the consultant, and, and you, your option preference might change. Do you have any idea of what it would cost to demo the entire property to offer it for uptown expansion, that kind of thing? We did get some preliminary estimates, but I do not recall what those are off the top of my head. So, maybe the sheriff remembers uh, the cost, but we we did get a number. I just don't remember. And if the sheriff says three quarters of a million. Three quarters to a million is okay. what I generally remember. So what's we, the problem? Would the property be reported? The value of the property be reported? Well, we, we certainly, I certainly think so. Um, yeah, you know, just based on the location, this is prime real estate. And so I think it would be. Um, and, and I would use probably a property on. Uh, Victor Drive, uh, in terms of cost per acre, uh, has been significant. And so if it property on Victor Drive, certainly in the heart of downtown, uptown, it would certainly, uh, I think, yes. Any other comments, questions, for everybody? registers their preference. Okay. So again, well, okay, there we go. Vote for your preference. One, two, three, or four. And again, this is, if money were no option, what would be your preference? And we will be coming back and you'll get to make another selection once we do know more specifics about each option.
And again, for those of you who do not have a smartphone and you want to vote, I would ask you just to take um, the handout that we gave you, circle, put an X by your option. You can leave it up here. You don't need to put your name on it. We're not interested in who voted how. What we're planning to do is take the results of the public meetings as well as this meeting with employees to council so they can see kind of the general thoughts at each one of the meetings and how everyone's preference kind of lined up. So thank you so much for your participation, um, and I'll turn it back over to the mayor, and we'll continue on with the Let's Talk Columbus. Thank you, Pam. Thank you all for participating in that, um, and thank goodness the technology worked. Um, you know, for the just so that you know, in, in every one of the public meetings that we've, we've done this exercise in, your results pretty much mirror theirs. Um, and I, I, my two cents, without getting too deep into it, I, I like the idea of moving from this site simply because if we stay here and we invest money in a, a remodel or a reconstruction, that's an expense. Whereas if you move, if you move this site somewhere else, if you move the building somewhere else, in an area that you have a chance to generate some economic development to serve the 800 people that will be in that building, now all of a sudden what you spend has a chance to be an investment with a return on that investment. So I like the odds of getting some of the cost ultimately defrayed, one by selling the other parcels, if that's what is decided to do, and the other is by generating a little bit of uh, development that may generate some sales tax dollars. I would ask John to, to walk you through that, but we've only got another hour. So uh, that's a, just, just to dig at our auditor, because he gets kind of passionate about, about that particular idea. All right, we'll move on to the part that I was really anxious about and kind of looking forward to, and that is a chance to kind of hear from y'all. And I'll start it off for you. Uh, I've already had uh, uh, one, one employee approach me with some questions that were submitted, or a question was submitted by uh, coworkers that couldn't make it. They were asking about the parking, uh, why uh, you have to pay to park in, in the uh, lot across the street. And some of the issues that are created, I think, just because of the parking zones that we have. And we were talking about it, and, and it may be time to revisit that. Uh, because I know that it, I, I'd be interested to see exactly how much money that we generate from, from the couple of dollars that we charge people to park there. And it, at one point, I was talking to the deputy city manager, that, that was uh, when, the, when the metro parking uh, department was um, was largely a, 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 an enterprise fund, which means they were supposed to pay for themselves. Every penny was pretty much precious. We had to make sure that we were coming close to breaking even. But I don't think we're doing it that way anymore. So I will tell you, starting off, we'll, we'll look at this and we'll see if there's a way to try to provide uh, parking for the employees that they don't have to pay for uh, if they're not parked in the garage. So we'll start with that one. Anybody else have any Anybody else have a comment or a, or a question or anything you want to bring up? Yes, ma'am. And, and I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to use a microphone. Uh, Mike King is, is uh, recording this for our use, for y'all's use. Hi. Hi. My question is, every year at South Commons, we used to play softball and kickball. So they stopped it because they said it was too many injuries. Is there any kind of way that we as an adult can sign a waiver where the city won't be held responsible? Because the morale has really went down since it stopped. Are you sure you're not open for like shuffleboard or something? <laughs> uh, I'm sitting there smiling because I still love to do that, but I would be one of those coming to work the next Monday in a cash. Um, yeah, we'll look at that. Because I, I happen to think that one of the best ways to create uh, a, a team, a team uh, atmosphere is to compete a little bit, uh, divide up into groups and start start doing this. I like I like the idea. We'll look at we'll look at uh, a way to try to uh, bring some of that back. And I know kickball is a big deal now. Um, I, I don't think I've played it in about 55 years, but it's uh, but it's a big deal again now. So we'll look at that. Thank you for that. Anybody else have a question? Christy. Yes, 
injury yes. in the round. And what is the city going to do to stop injured employees from being forced out when they are released by a doctor to come back to work full duty? You and I have talked about this, and yes. I've told you, in my opinion, if we have somebody that's cleared by a doctor, particularly in public safety, and, we're, and, and for those of you who haven't seen, if you, if you haven't looked at the last council meeting's um, broadcast, I would, because we walked through what we call critical vacancies, areas of our, our general government and our public safety where we have some vacancies that are critical. Critical, I think we defined as anything, any position unfilled for six months in a row. Is that right? Wrong person? But anyway, where's Rita? Six, six months, and then um, also, if it was, of course, every job is critical, but these have a critical nature for the, for the performance of the duties of that organization. Uh, we are, I can tell you we're talking about that, and we're looking for a way to try to make sure that doesn't happen. We just had two more. I know that. And, and when, to me, if they're released by a doctor, and I know there's risk management issues at, at play, but if they're released by a doctor and a doctor's willing to sign that they are healthy enough to go back to uh, full service, mm -hmm. um, I'm having a hard time understanding why we would not allow them to do so. And the second question that I had, this is, this was brought to me by a group of people that weren't able to come or out of retaliation fear. Yes, ma'am. That could the city implement some sort of way for employees to report bullying by superiors without the retaliation. Because right now... I take it there's no confidence in the whistleblower program? Well, if you file, I'll, I'll just say for instance at the police department, you file, I know we've talked about this, the fair treatment, you get suspended. It goes back through the exact same chain that suspended you. If you file a hostile work environment, it goes through the same chain that you're filing the complaint on. There is no secure way for them to file this complaint and feel confident that it will be investigated because it goes through your chain of command that you're complaining on. Right. All right. There's, there is a, I think I'm right, the, the, the whistleblower line that is, is open and, and it is designed so that they can leave a message uh, uh, on that uh, on that source and, and give details and it is confidential and I can tell you as public safety director if it's involving public safety I promise you it's going to be looked at. I'll look at it. Um, I, I can tell you and I understand the issue because sometimes in, in this being very frank and very transparent when you've got inner office uh, issues uh, whether they're personnel issues or, or personality issues um, the, the challenge is trying to get that investigated because if you were to come to me with an issue and what I would say to you, all right, well, now here's the deal. If I go chase this and I go try to see if we can get it fixed, they'll know where it came from. I'm okay with that if you're okay with that on an individual basis. So what, what happens, I think, is, is sometimes the individual making that complaint, the, the challenge is to try to investigate something without giving specifics about that particular issue. But if they get on the whistleblower hotline, it will be investigated, and it and, – and I. To my knowledge, it's confidential. And if I'm telling you it is, that means it better be. If I hear anybody compromising that, then we'll have another critical vacancy. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I have two. One is, when is someone going to look at um, the city ordinance, ordinance, I'm sorry, my son's saying, with employees after 30 years of service still paying into the pension plan? At 30 years, you maxed out, it counts nothing toward it. When is someone going to look at it so employees with 30 years no longer have to pay into the pension plan? I'll, I'll take that to the pension uh, board and ask that. I'd love to tell you I know enough about it to give you an answer, but if I did, I'd just be trying to fool me and you, and that wouldn't work very well. Um, I do know that there are challenges with any pension plan, particularly a defined benefit plan, and keeping it funded making sure that we are as close to fully funded as we can be in order to protect all of the employees. Uh, I'm not saying that's an excuse. I'm just saying I, that's the limitation almost of what I know. But, but we'll check. I will check into that. And, and we'll, um, if, if you'll give your, give your name to uh, somebody from my staff who I should have already introduced, uh, they, they will, I'll, we'll get back with you and make sure that you have an answer. I'm sorry I can't answer. Okay. The other one, uh, piggybacks off of Berlin, 
Linda. Every year, the employees in Public Works feels like they're not worth anything. Giving three dollars for each employee during that week to have any activities. An employee who's worked a whole year, they're worth saying give them three three dollars per employee. That doesn't even buy a Big Mac meal today. Uh, <laughs> Is that, is that done during the Employee, employee Appreciation Week? They only get three dollars per employee. Can someone please look at that? I have asked every year if someone. I can tell you we will look at it, but I can also tell you going through the budget right now that may all be that may be all we are able to do right now is look at it. But I hear you, and, and and you know if we if we provide something for the employees, and here's the challenge with three thousand employees uh, in the in the consolidated government. As badly as we want to try to do something that is appreciated and it makes a little bit of a difference, we're really kind of, there are limitations. I hate to say that, but there are. That's why I think it's so critical that if we can do things that really matter to employees, like whether it's kickball tournaments or whether it's, um, you know, just allowing departments to do an ice cream Sunday day or, or, you know, something that doesn't cost a lot but still allows you guys to, uh, oh, my wife would be kicking me in the shin. I always say you guys. I don't mean that, you know, in any way other than just a, like a y'all. Uh, but, but it allows you to uh, do some team building and feel good about where you work and make sure that you know how much we appreciate you. So we'll look at that. And, and if, it's not, if it's not something that, that is, you know, maybe it looks a little like we're trying not to help you, then, then we probably shouldn't do it at all. Mayor Pro Tem. And I should have done this before. We've got, I know we've got Councillor John House here, the Sheriff is here, the Mayor Pro Tem is here, and I don't know if I, I didn't see if any other elected officials raise your hand. Uh, and, and I also want to introduce, uh, you know, Alexis and, uh, and, and Diane Carnes and Richard Bishop from, from the mayor's office. They did an amazing job in trying to get all this stuff set up. So I should have thanked them to start with, but thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Can you make a part of your report back to the council? Give us a synopsis of the meetings, the, talking to the mayor's meetings, so we can have a part of official, official records to say government. But the questions that's asked today. We can. Can we make the questions and answers a part of the official records? Yes, So that all employees can know what, what was said. And I think that's a good idea. We'll, we'll, I mean, we, I don't want to, I don't want people to get camera shy, but we'll, we, broad, we will broadcast this because we want the employees that couldn't make it to know that you guys were asking questions and that we were, we were promising answers if we didn't have the answers today. So we will. Thank you, ma'am. That's a good idea. Yeah, yes, sir. I've got a question on behalf of fellow co-workers here. Yes, sir. Um, we are part of public safety in the Scotia County Prison. Right. We are the lowest paid scale in public, public safety. We have to go through a five-week course at uh, BCOT at Forsyth. We have to go through more training than the sheriff's correctional officers, and they make more salary than we do. And we are in question that why is that and can it be corrected so that we can keep this retention problem we're having at our prison as well that wasn't reported in the news uh, at a down low because it is, we got officers that are having to come in on their off days and getting compensation time for it. And it's really causing a morale situation for staff as well. And uh, the other thing is the compensation time, we do not get paid overtime at all and uh, it's not in the budget and I know that uh, our warden, Warden Hammer, has requested some things on new budget coming and he discussed that in our briefing our, uh, at the end of the month celebration we had and I know that is in the works but is there something that you can reiterate to try to enforce these things with the city council to help us out because we're starting to pay for us is 31 five, and the sheriff's Deputies, uh, sheriff, uh, correctional officers make about five to six thousand dollars more salary per year than we do starting out, and we're losing officers from our area to them. So, and it's really hurting our staff. 
I appreciate I appreciate your comments. Um, I will tell you that, that it, it should have been on the news because they were y'all were included in the critical vacancies uh, that were One presented. Well. Uh, yeah, there was at one point there was parity with public safety, and, and just like uh, back in 2004, I believe there was the, an adoption of the um, uh, pay plan, the University of Georgia pay plan, and we actually, for a brief moment in time, got to 100% of funding, and that was our objective, that was our goal. In fact, it was it was sort of a, a collaborative because the FOP at the time uh, approached council and basically said, we don't want you to come up with this pay plan. So they went through the Chamber of Commerce. We had three or four members of council, I think the Mayor Pro Tem and I were both on that committee, that sat down with business leaders, the Chamber, and with um, public safety and general government representatives. And what came out of that was a UGA pay plan with a commitment to try to get closer and closer to 100% funded based on market, market level for the jobs that UGA graded out. And we got there in about 2007, and then 2008 hit and the recession began. And we began losing, losing ground on that pay plan. We still have a, a, a good pay plan. What we have is a poorly funded pay plan. And over the years, that funding has eroded in, well, I won't say it's eroded. It just hasn't been able to keep pace with, with some of the cost of living uh, that you guys have been, have been experiencing. Um, retention has been a huge issue. Uh, the, problem for y'all is that you're losing some of the folks to the sheriff. And what we hear from the sheriff is she's losing some of her folks to the PD. Uh, and, and the fact is there are a lot of different things that are at play in, in not being able to hang on to our qualified officers. I can tell you that I, I wish I could tell you how we're going to do it. But I can tell you that it's a focus. It was when I came in and I told people when I first got here, this wasn't an election promise or campaign promise. This was something we said when we got here, and that is that we understand that we have to take care of the people that take care of the people. You guys are the ones that are delivering the services. So we have to make sure that we're allowing you to pay, earn a living wage while you take care of, of, of the folks that live in this community. Um, I'm not going to go through a long deal about the budget. You guys have heard it before. You understand what our, what our challenges are. I can tell you that we've got some things we're working on right now to try to help identify ways to free up additional operating. If we come up with an extra 500000 or million, whatever, whatever the, form, uh, the, the amount is, in the, um, at the end of the year, that doesn't go towards salaries because we don't know yet if it's going to reoccur the next year. It can't be a one-time spike in revenue and then we obligate it for pay pick because then we're going to end up with a situation where we've got even tougher decisions to make about personnel. So all I can do is promise you that we're going to be looking at it and we're trying to make some changes in the pay plan. Uh, one of our first initiatives in this budget is frankly to get you a little more money that you take home. So in other words, it may not be a huge increase uh, across the board, but we're going to try to make sure that there's no offset from insurance premiums or, or any of your uh, contributions to your pension so that there's actually a net going to the, to the, to the employees. Um, and we're going to try to get better with our focus on what we're trying to do and accomplish each year. Okay, so yeah. um, with, with the raises that we do achieve yearly, we've seen the increase in health care. Well, the increase in health care takes our raises. So we're making the same money we've been making for the last three or four years. So it's redundant. In a, in a sense. So, uh, in other words. No, I get you. And that's what I was just trying to say. I didn't say it as, as well as you did. But that's our focus and what we intend to do with this budget, the one we're putting together right now. I can't promise you how much of an increase it's going to be. It may not be a ton, but it will be a net increase. So we're not going to offset that with any rise in your rates. You'll still have an opportunity. And by the way, I'm, I, I don't own stock in a wellness center, but I'll tell you, if you're not using that wellness center, you cheat yourself and your family. That you don't have to give up your doctor. You can get in there for, for stuff and, and get seen and get your medicine for free. And if you go for the health assessment, you get a reduction on your insurance premium. Shameless plug for that. But thank you so much for asking that question. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, kind of to 
piggyback on what my co-worker was saying, who has the authority to give us overtime pay instead of comp time? I was off on my off day last year. I'm at the movies watching a movie. My lieutenant called me and asked me, he said he needed me to come to work to go do hospital duty and inmate swallow a razor blade. I'm like 10-4, sir, let me go home and change. I'll be right out. Comp time doesn't put gas in my car. Comp time doesn't put money in my pocket to buy food when I go to work. So everything goes up except my pay. And I understand you just touched on that, but this comp time is like working for free. I'm 52 years old, and it's hard. I do uh, public safety corrections because I take pride in what I do. And we keep the public safe. The general public don't know what corrections actually do. It's really not what you see on TV. It's way more important than that. So we really feel undervalued and underappreciated. The last thing, um, it's in our employee handbook. If we miss three days of work, we have to have a doctor's excuse to return to work. They are forcing us to bring, if we miss one day, we are forced to have a doctor's slip to return back to work just for one day. That's not what it says in the, in the employee handbook. So I don't understand why we're having to do that. Thank you. Well, we'll look. Yes. The shortage doesn't allow for anyone to take their time off. So you build comp time that you can't use because we're short. Well, I, no, I, I do appreciate you asking the question. Uh, I can tell you that the direct answer to who has control over overtime versus comp time is the mayor and council. Because if it makes it in the mayor's budget, council would have to approve it. And we get right back to the same issue of trying to be able to have enough resources to be able to pay for the things that we want to pay for. I can tell you, and it, you know, this is... This is something that we talked about when I was on council. And I can tell you that I, I, can, I can guarantee you that Mayor Pro Tem and John House and, and, the, and the other eight members of council feel the exact same way. The biggest frustration that we felt when we get the budget from the mayor, and even on this side of it, I can tell you it's not any easier, is that we know that the employees feel undervalued because sometimes too many, Oftentimes, people equate to the value you feel for them of what you're, what you're paying, what you're compensating. The hardest thing council does is try to create a budget without eliminating any services for the public and still being able to make sure we pay for the employees. Um, I, don't have, I wish I had a great answer to make you feel good about what I'm telling you, but I don't. Bottom line is, right now, that's the way it is because that's the extent of our resources. Is it sad? Am I satisfied with that? No. Is the council satisfied with that? No. Um, we appreciate the employees. That's one of the reasons we're doing this. Um, there are no holds barred. If you guys want to say something today, this is your chance to say it. I understand how you feel. I really do. And, um, and we're working on it. I can't promise it's going to happen this year, and I can't even promise it's going to happen next year. But we're aware of it, and we're focused on it. Yes, ma'am. Now, I'm going to tell them what you said to me in the elevator. <laughs> And she I said, appreciate, I, I, was the, I think that I was the one that asked you to make a meeting with the employees. Yes. Um, and the reason is very simple. We've been neglected. We've been neglected as employees. I'm not a politician, I'm just a mother, and I love, I feel passion to help people. And also, but I want, when I do that, I want also to take care of my family. And when I came here today, I came straight to ask you for my 8%. But you need money to build the government center and for all the needs that have the city. And this is my third time on the city. I was military family, so I came on my three tours, I've been here. I found out that when you come uh, after two years, you are not any longer be like rehired with all the benefits. Military tours are at least three years. So that put some family members out of the benefits that they already uh, have it. 
That's one of the things. Other things that for me happening, I was part of a board, I've been selected to be part of the board of children and family for me as a Latina was very important for me. And I have to surrender because I become a part of the government, a city government. So I have to resign. And I think that should not because all have to, we have to work together. And you have, many uh, you have many challenges right now. Uh, our model is low. Uh, we have needs also. But we are public service. Uh, we, we love to do that. Your ag agencies are working uh, separate. We don't know what other uh, agencies do like we used to be before. It's like every person has their own republic. We have to stick together for the citizens because that's why we are here, to serve the citizens, especially the one on me. So that is some things that I just want to appoint you. And as me, I work with the Department of Labor in Puerto Rico. And one of my jobs was to uh, try to convince corporations to come and invest on in my city. Uh, I work with the municipal court, but beside that, I want to collaborate with you in anything that you think that I'm able to do. I'd be glad to help you 100%. Thank, Thank you. you. No, I appreciate it. Can I tell them what you said to me when you met me in the elevator? I, I was like my second day in. She, she says, I didn't vote for you. But I'm counting on you. <laughs> so, yes, but um, so, yes, no, I, I, I was. I I'm very you. honest, and I didn't. I just vote for the person that come to me and ask me as right. employee, what are your needs? Right. No, uh, I just, listen, I was being just you teased. with 20 years with the person that take my eight <laughs> uh, percent, I don't feel confident. But I now know. you are aboard, and you have all my. Support. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, and I will say a couple of things. You touched on a lot. Of, a, a lot. And I will tell you that, that one of the things that we have done, if you haven't heard about it, um, we, we are forming, uh, matter of fact, the first meeting, I think it's tomorrow morning, we're forming an, uh, what we're calling an innovation committee. And it's going to be made up of employees. And the idea is we'll have one representative from each department. I did not want somebody appointed by a director. I wanted somebody who was nominated and voted on by their by their peers. And the idea is we're going to have a round table. It's not my meeting. It's it's your meeting. You know, those are the members that are on that innovation committee. And what, we, what I want you to do, if you're not the representative from your area on it, talk to them. Because we're going to listen to you about things can, that can be done better to deliver the services to the citizens. You do what you do. To a very large extent, the same for the same reason that, that the elected officials do what they do. And that is because you have a heart for service, you care about what you do, you take pride in the way you do it. All you want, and I hear it from, from some of you uh, occasionally, what you want is to, to feel like you're appreciated for what you do. So what we're trying to do is get is narrow in and focus in on what those things are that we can do to try to make you feel better about coming to work, make you feel more hopeful about the way the, the general government and public safety pay plans are, are moving. Uh, admittedly, we cannot, I can't, we can't make any big changes right away. That's not going to happen right away. But I do think that if, I really believe, I said this at, at another venue, that what you focus on expands. And if we focus on taking care of people, then we're going to get really, really better at it. And, and that is our, our intention. So I would urge you to take part in that innovation committee. Speak to your representative that's on that on that organization. I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to that. To trying to get, I told you we're flipping the org chart. So the folks that are on the front lines are the ones that we want to hear information from about how we can better and more efficiently and effectively deliver some of these services to the citizens. Because the better we get at it, the leaner government can get, and then the more we can compensate the folks that are providing those citizens, those citizens that that service. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Plan on reducing crime in Columbus. 
We've got, we've, how much time we got? We, no, I'm just kidding. We actually, well, number one, one of the big things we need to do is fill some of these critical vacancies in, in, the, in the prison as well as the sheriff's office, fire to fire and EMS. They have, fire and EMS, and EMS used to, if they had four vacancies, they'd have 120 applicants. And that doesn't happen, it's not happening right now. They've got vacancies right now and they're only getting a couple of dozen applicants. So one of the things we've got to do, we've talked about, and that is try to make sure that our pay plan is funded to a point where we can not only attract, but we can retain good people in our public safety and our first responders. But there are other things that have to be done. I've said this publicly and some people get upset by it, but we have great law enforcement officers. I mean, they're awesome. If you, if you commit a crime, chances are you're going to get caught. You're going to spend time first in the jail, and then they're going to sentence you to the prison. The biggest problem we have right now, though, is they're, they're law enforcement. We need crime prevention. Now, Seth Brown is here, and his board does a really good job at trying to identify areas to fund so that we can cut off the food supply. There are two areas that we're focusing on in the mayor's office. One is, is youth, is young people, and the other is recidivism. Uh, John House had been, uh, Councilor House had been involved with a um, Committee on Reentry. Well, we have just formed a Mayor's Commission on Reentry that is designed to try to help people who are released from prison get integrated back into the housing market and back into a job market immediately to hold down on them heading right back to where they came from uh, in the old neighborhoods and still commit crimes again. The other thing is trying to provide some structure and some alternatives for the young people. So we're in the process of putting together a pilot to bring back the Summer Youth Work Program. Right now, those federal dollars, uh, because they're limited, are going to the, most of them to the poorer counties outside of Columbus, and it's going to pe uh, young people 18 to 24. Well, we're looking at trying to get the eight, uh, 15 to, to 18, and we want it to stay in Muskogee County. So we're going to pilot that program, and, and we're going to pay them a meaningful wage. We're not going to pay them minimum wage. We're going to give them maybe 10 bucks an hour, something so that when they get that paycheck, they're going to be proud enough they're going to stick with the program and they'll be occupied, their time will be occupied during the summer. And what about the kids that are a little bit younger that are still maybe unsupervised during the summer or not as supervised? Holly Browder created a summer pass last year and that allowed young people to get into uh, rec centers and pools at either, either free or a greatly reduced price. So we thought, man, that's a great idea. Let's try to expand that. So what we're now looking at doing is the rec centers and the pools are still in play. We're trying to add the museums. We're going to allow these, uh, the children free access to the different National Infant Museum, Port Columbus, Space, Coke Hill Space Science Center, the Columbus Museum. We're even working with the YMCA. We haven't gotten it hammered out yet, but I'm hopeful that we'll have uh, their facilities as an option too. We'll also allow them to use the card that we issue as a bus pass to eliminate some of the transportation issues so they can actually get to some of these facilities. That's what we're starting with. Um, I'm hoping through some of the innovation committee meetings and by talking with other neighborhoods that we'll come up with some additional ideas that we can implement that don't cost a ton of money, but yet they provide some structure and try to, try to create a, a situation where we really just, we cut off the food supply um, because we catch them when they commit the crime. What we need to start doing is, is catching them before they commit the crime, before they become a ward of the state in one of these prisons. So that's what we're doing right now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Man, I, um, I, I called my daughter after I'd been here a week. She lives in Atlanta. I said, how long is your commute? She said, 45 minutes. I, said, I got you beat. The elevators are a problem. Uh, you know, it, when you have to time your day to get here 30 minutes early just to get to your desk on time, it's crazy. I can tell you that the construction is nearly completed. And as soon as that construction finishes, all four elevators will be running again. I, do we have a, we don't really have a timeline. But another couple of weeks? Another couple of weeks. So anyway. Sorry. Yes, sir. My name is Mike Leach, and I'm with 
fleet management at the city? Yes, sir. And uh, I want to make you aware of our situation. And our situation is we have aging mechanics. And a lot of them are going to retire within the next two years. And, uh, and we're short. So that means more trucks are coming in than we can possibly repair in one day. So they're backing up on us, which affects sanitation. It affects the police department. It definitely affects fire and ambulance departments. But, uh, you know, I'm coming to you today to ask for help in that area. Uh, we've done everything that we can do from switching employees around to uh, all kind of innovative things to keep the work flowing. But it, it boils down to is people. And uh, people are leaving because of pay. Compression is one reason. Pay, benefits. And uh, the baby boomer generation is going away. I'm one of them. And uh, I, you've got to do something pretty quick because it's going to affect everybody in the city, uh, all departments, because when the wheels don't turn, they can't move. Do um, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we've been talking a lot about that. And, and you didn't even touch on a, another part of that problem that makes it even worse, and that is we've got an aging fleet. So we're having more vehicles that need your attention, and we have fewer folks working in that area that are able to work on it. And the ones that are, we just talked about it in the last week. Um, they've been here a long time, so they're all looking at retirement. I hate to throw out just ideas because, because then if, if they don't flesh out, if we were unable to make it work for one reason or another, then uh, you look like you've kind of stonewalled somebody. But I can tell you, I will say this. I do believe that with our pay scale being where it is, our best hope for trying to build a bench Build, build a, a plan so that people are coming up, moving up behind, is we've got to focus on some of the, the younger people who are looking to cut their teeth and earn, you know, learn their, their business in their first job. And I have enough confidence in the folks that are in the positions now that they will be able to nurture those people and help them get better at what they're doing. But one of the things that we're looking at is maybe working with some of the, the colleges and the, and the technical colleges to allow them, as they come out of that certificate program, to come into an employment opportunity so that they can begin to, to actually get some experience under the guidance of people who know how to take care of these, 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 uh, this fleet. Now, truthfully, are they going to stick around for 30, 40 years? Yeah, maybe some of them will, but, but probably not. Most of these millennials, I think, uh, the city manager shared a slide. It was a survey, and, and, and it, one, this is an actual question that they asked, what do you think defines loyalty? Millennials said staying on a job seven months. So that means we don't need to find people, we need to find a pipeline. So we're going to have to, that's why we're looking at trying to, we're, we have not even communicated with these directors yet. But the idea is to try to create a curriculum that allows them to come to work for the city of Columbus and be earning credit and still getting some of the job, real life job experience and maybe help us plug some of those holes. Um, but we, we've got to, we've got to become a little more creative in how we try to find people uh, and, and it's, it's getting harder and harder to do. Uh, and, and it's a combination of things. And, and, the, and the sad truth is that when the economy is really good, you've got a much smaller pool of applicants. Because you can get a kid that grew up on a computer, never went to college, get a job in, in some IT department because they can make that thing get up and dance. Um, so that's another thing that we're competing with right now, too. So, I listen, I thank you so much for what you're doing. I know you're overloaded, and I know you, you're still keeping the trucks on the streets, at least so far. So uh, thank you. We, we are working on it. We're aware of it, and we're working on it. I have one other thing. Okay. I know finance is heavily involved in purchasing of equipment. Yes. They never talk to us of what's good and what's not. You know, and we're buying some bad equipment. It, it's repetitive repairs on it and it's very expensive. And uh, I think we need to be included 
in on some discussion before they buy equipment. That, that is exactly the kind of information we need to be sharing from department to department. Because you know what you need. And finance knows how to get it paid for. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure you're communicating. And, and that's one of the things that needs to come out of this innovation committee. Is we need to, we need, we've got to identify a way to streamline our communication among ourselves. Somebody else said a little while, you were saying we, we're one team. A lot of different skill sets, a lot of different very unique uh, jobs within this, within this government, but everyone has the same objective. If, if you're working on a truck, if you're emptying a trash can, if you're uh, washing windows, you are delivering services to the citizens of Columbus. And, and you can't do your, they can't do their job if you don't do your job. And you can't do yours unless finance does theirs. So we're going to fix that. And we're, and well, you know how we're going to fix it? You're going to fix it. The, the, the employees are going to tell us how they need this communication to flow so that they can be effective. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. I also work with Mike Waits in the fleet um, maintenance building in the admin part. And I was thinking as well, as far as manning, that possibly reaching at a high school level, um, a, maybe like an internship, where we're kind of recruiting at that point and splitting up the students' day where they're leaving from school to come to the shop and they're, they can build towards getting a certificate where they could possibly come and work for the city and have those credentials under their belt coming in and possibly offer a sign-in bonus or some type of initiative to push that. All I can say is I hope one of y'all is on that innovation committee. Um, I love that. And, you know, here's the deal. With the dual enrollment program right now in, in Georgia, that high school kid can not only maybe work half a day uh, in fleet maintenance, they can also be earning a two-year degree the last two years of their high school. So they can graduate with that certificate in automotive mechanics or whatever they need to be able to be successful. That's such a good idea. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, Mayor. I'm Alex. Hey, Alex. My intern in your office. Alex is my intern, by the way. Alex has done an amazing job. He's graduated from Carver High School this year, and uh, he's been spending the last three weeks in Washington, D.C., lobbying for funding for technical, and technical education. Absolutely. So we're talking about uh, filling in the pipeline of workers in um, technical fields. One of the great things is in our high schools in Muskogee County, a lot of them have these pathways that end up, when they finish these pathways, they take an end of path in this, a pathway assessment that certifies them with industry credentials in automotive mechanics, in IT, in a lot of these industries. So I think one of the ways to fix the issue of uh, to fix the issue of a shortage in the workforce is to uh, definitely reach out to the schools and reaching out to the high schools because we have work-based learning in Muskegon County. Going that avenue allows us to have a pool of candidates to pick from. So those work-based learning students could leave school half a day, come work with fleet maintenance or whatever, even public safety. And so a lot of our schools, Shaw High School actually has a public safety pathway where they're training students through, whether it be through EMS, whether it be through uh, the police department as well. And so get, whether it be just through a job shadowing opportunity like I'm doing with you, Opening up those opportunities, like you guys said, allows for us to be able to identify the workforce that is to come. Thanks, Alex. Go sit down before they try to make you mayor. <laughs> now, he's, listen, I, I will say this. Uh, he's such a great example of what is in our high schools right now. And to your point, we're probably not leveraging that as much as we should. Uh, David Lewis and I, when I first got in office, I called David and I said, hey, it's ridiculous for you and I not to be talking on a regular basis. We get our money from the same people, we're serving the same people, and we all have the same goals. We want an educated workforce, and they can't be an educated workforce if they're not making good grades in school. So he and I are talking, and I guarantee you, you guys have just given us our next topic for our next meeting. So I, I, I love it. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I like it. About 
two or three so weeks prior to graduation, uh, going around to these high schools and maybe going and having a forum or for you know for the city and showing uh, maybe pamphlets and stuff for the police department, the prisons, the uh, the shop, the sheriff's department, all the departments here to try to give them some type of background and field. We're writing this stuff down. I think these are all outstanding ideas. I mean, it's we up, ma'am. Good. Outstanding ideas. You know, this is this is the kind of um, interaction that, that that we want to empower you to 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 bring forward. And so when we get in that innovation community, and I keep harping on that, but but when I listen to y'all talk about these great ideas, I mean, sometimes when we sit around trying to solve some of these challenges. Sometimes the most obvious things just, you know, it's like the elephant in the room that you don't see. And so when you bring it up and, and you see how it could work in your individual areas, I mean, that's, that's powerful. So I'm, I just get more and more excited about the opportunity to interact and basically just turn that committee loose and, and have them charged with, with coming up with ideas. So that's terrific. Anybody else have anything? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I was wanting to ask you about the retirement, the public safety retirement, because yes. when I got hired in 2013, um, I was told that I was going to pay in 6%, and then I think it was maybe six months a year later, it got bumped up to 8%, and I was told we was going to pay in 40, or we was going to receive 40, and now I'm hearing that we're going to get back 60. But my main question is, is why is somebody that's been hired in 2013 and later paying in double from somebody from just a year prior? You know, they had a, um, uh, they had a, a committee they put together because the pension plan after a lot of those, uh, a lot of the investments after the recession tanked and we got into a real challenge with, um, with our pension plan being funded. Uh, and so I think, and I'm not saying this is good or bad or right or wrong, I'm just trying to tell you the best I remember and Reether can kind of fill in all these big gaps I'll leave, but so what they did is that committee tried to look at a way to try to make sure that the pension plan was going to serve the greatest number of people. They took a look at what other areas were doing and what the kind of contributions. Most plans, and I know it sounds crazy because we beat ours up because we know it so well, but most plans are not nearly as solid on a, on a, on a um, uh, defined benefit stand from a defined benefit standpoint. But what, what happened, the committee made recommendations in order to create a solvency is to have a, a line in the sand that if you were hired after a certain point, you paid more into the pension plan. And I, I can tell you right now, after talking with actually some of the firefighters, but um, that created a, 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 it created a real hardship because you've got folks that are standing side by side in a burning building and one has a greater benefit really than the other. And that happens throughout government. It happens in the, pub, in the uh, police department, the sheriff's office as well. Um, I can tell you that with a pension plan, it's all about solvency. It's all about making sure that it's funded. It's all about making sure that your future liabilities are covered now. Uh, so it's really, really hard to change. I can tell you if I had a magic wand and it wouldn't hurt anything, I'd put it right back to where everybody was paying the same amount. Uh, but I don't. And even if it's something that we continue to focus on, it's not going to happen anytime soon because things keep changing. We just went to a new uh, actuarial uh, table uh, because over time, people are living longer. And, and our old one, I think, should, the one at mortality table, yes, from our actuary. I knew that big word get me in trouble. Um, but yeah, but so what, it, what was happening is people, when, when we were figuring our calculations on people living to about 72, now they're living into their mid-80s in the new mortality table takes that into account, which means that you have to have more money in your fund. So our funded portion dropped a little bit when they changed that table. All that, listen, if it's like you, it's going over my head. But, but all I can tell you is that I, I understand where you're coming from. We're aware of the fact that, that a lot of the firefighters, a lot of the police department really feel that like that's an inequity. And, and we'll look at it. And we're going to continue to try to find a way to balance it back out. I can just tell you, it all comes down to how funded that plan is, and any small change in the plan has a dramatic impact on how well it's funded. 
So I understand. I wish we could fix it right now, but we can't. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that part. The, yeah, the, the, max, the maximum is 60% uh, across the board. So there, it's not 40. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, I, I guess, right. Yeah, if, if you, yeah, what, she, what Pam said. It's 2% a year. It's, it's not really a penalty. It's just you're foregoing 2% a year if you retire early or if with, with less years of service. Yes, ma'am. Something that I want uh, that you maybe contemplate um, is like uh, until so many countries uh, have um, spent money uh, trying to bring visitors to their places, you have for Benin. For Benin bring people all around the world. And the situation as a military family when we want to spend that money, we have to go someone else. Because the city don't attract like um, outlets, things like that, that the people can bring, can come here and spend not only their money, the money, the families that are visiting and all around. We don't have that kind of things in here. We have to go to Atlanta or even La Grange. So I think that that is a good possibility that you have like a, a diamond right there to bring, to, to try to keep that money that all those families have plus the, visit, the visitors that are on the city. Because I never, I never thought or I never see that the government, the city government tried to keep that money here. Well, and, I'll, and I, re, I respect so much your opinion, but I'm going to disagree with it. Um, I think that Muskogee County, Columbus, Georgia, is that jewel. I think that we have more to do here, and most of the people that say that there's nothing to do have probably not gone out their backyard unless they're going to something that they know about in Atlanta. But Columbus has got so many activities to do. I mean, it's, if you like uh, the arts, there's not a better city outside of Atlanta to go visit because you've got the Springer Theater, you've got the, the River Center, you've got you, you know, even the Liberty Theater, uh, the Civic Center. Uh, so if you like outdoor activities, you've got whitewater rafting, zip lining, we've got mountain biking that's coming uh, to, to the northern part of town. Uh, if you like museums, we've got two national museums. One of them's ranked number one on a list of the best free museums in the world. So there is a lot to do. I can tell you, it's kind of like, it's kind of, it's kind of like if you're a landscaper or you own a garden center, your yard usually looks worse because you don't pay attention to it. Or if you live at the beach, you don't go to the beach. Uh, but there's a lot to do in Columbus. But we're, we continue to try to find ways to communicate that. Because just like you said, if you're unaware of some of those, we need to do a better job of making sure. And you're exactly right at Fort Benning. I mean, you've got those graduations out there almost every weekend. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people just stop and eat at the fife and drum instead of going right down the street and, and seeing uh, Uptown where they've got all these amazing restaurants, they can sit out there with a view of the river, they can watch the splash pad. So you're right, we do need to do a better job of making sure people understand what's, what we have. Yes, ma'am. All right, and we, we promised to get you out at seven. We still got some time though. If anybody, anybody have anything else? Yes, sir. My name's Sam. I've been working for the uh, Parks and Recs uh, Department for a couple years. Yes, I'm sir. not from around here. Okay. Uh, I'm from California originally. Well, we're glad you're here now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, the, the common problem is there's not enough money. Um, so I have a suggestion okay. that might help that. It might be just a little bit. Um, just for some background, my hometown of Los Alamitos, I served on the Parks and Rec Commission there for almost six years. And our department for Parks and Recreation, our number one goal was to be revenue neutral. So we didn't pull any money from the city, we made all of it up ourselves. For example, when our city had its 50th anniversary, the city gave us $10,000 of seed money to do events throughout the year for celebrations and stuff. We did a parade, 
we had a weekend carnival, we built an outdoor plaza, all sorts of things throughout the year. At the end of that year, we handed back that $10,000 check because we made it all up with other donations, other fundraising tools. In Columbus, however, the city council does not allow us to do those kinds of things. The way the policies are right now, we cannot charge, say if we're doing an outdoor event, and we want to do hot dogs or something, we can't charge anybody hot dogs. I can't charge them a dollar for a hot dog. You know, we're, that money could go right back in the city instead of them going to the vending machine and buying something and that money goes somewhere else. Um, also, you know, we could charge to go into the rec centers. You mentioned those in the, the passes. Those are always free. Um, we don't charge for anything, but that doesn't stop anybody from, say, Harris County coming down, enjoying our facilities, not paying a dime, and we're the ones who are having to put the bill for whatever wear and tear goes on. So. With those in mind, we have a lot of expenses, but no revenue. If we were able to supplement, you know, things from outside, concessions, whatever, suddenly Parks and Rec is not going to pull as much money from the city. That money could go somewhere else, say, to the prisons, to public safety, to the guys working on the cars, and you're not having to worry about, well, we got to provide for Parks and Rec. Just a suggestion. Sam, I like the way you think. Um, I will tell you that uh, that's always a very sensitive subject because Parks and Rec and Holly have come up and they've, they've given us some suggested fee increases and that's always very very sensitive I think to council but what you're saying is something really different because that would allow Parks and Rec if they hosted some of these uh, events and programming at some of the facilities then they could charge for some of the snacks or drinks or whatever and then retain those fees for operating their department. That's interesting. It deserves uh, being vetted. I'm not sure, not sure if council would approve it or not. But it, it, I appreciate you bringing it up. It's a great idea. Anybody else? Okay. At the prison, the inmate workforce that we provide for the city at the from the Muskogee County Prison, a lot of people don't really realize the money that's saved with the city and the taxpayers here in Columbus. It's around 17.9 million. I mean, some 17 million, something like that, that their net worth for the job duties they do in the city with cleaning up, beautification, along with the uh, trash, the trash uh, pickup, and everything they do here in the city. And they, they, they're, they have, they're in the government center, they're at the civic center, they're all over the city. These inmates are. So it's free, a free workforce. But this, you know, it's really a good thing for the city to save money because if we didn't have that you would not believe what taxes you'd be paying now the other thing on the second thing is the you know us providing that uh you know why like i reiterated earlier we are the lowest paid in public safety 31.5 31,000 a year point five everybody else the sheriff's department the police department i'm not sure about the marshal's pay but we're one of the lowest paid paid in public safety uh, fire department, EMS, all them, they make a lot more money than we do. It's tough for our, us as employees here making a living on 31.5. My wife is 12 years older than I am. She's retired. She gets $600 a month, Social Security, and we try to live off my income and her Social Security. You do the math and think about it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else have anything? Um, well, look, this, we're going to be doing this again. Uh, I want to do one of these every quarter when we do the um, when, we, when we do the other talk. Uh, let's talk clubs. Oh, yes, ma'am. How are you? I'm an employee. Yes, ma'am. Um, I drive a trash truck. Um, we do have that um, equipment, but our morale sucks. It's low pay. It's uh, dealing with inmates who have bad attitudes, they're trying to get drugs, they're trying to um, look at women, whatever. And me as a female, that's even difficult. Uh, and I'm going to go back to the pay. It's, he says, they're low, we're low. And it, it's getting harder. We got so many people leaving now because of pay. They're going to other jobs because around the area, they're paying higher. And we, we need to keep up somewhere. And 
you were talking about free giving things away for free. You know, we go to the landfill and we got that storm, um, and they're making that mulch. You can sell that to the people in the community. There's so many ways the city can make money uh, with that mulch. You can tell them bring your own bags. You know, we'll sell it to you for a dollar. That would be income. The city needs to bring income in and revenue in. And we're giving everything away, including our services. Uh, trash is a priority. Yard waste and recycling, uh, trash and recycling are a priority. Uh, technically, yard waste is picked up for free. And then we're out here, and then there's a lot of stuff out there that people are putting out. These guys are overworked. The inmates are overworked. We're tired. We technically don't really get a lunch uh, a lunch break. We take a break, but we don't get we don't get any time. And we're working and we're driving these heavy equipment. And like I said, it's mainly morale, but it it is the job. I, listen, I hear you, and and I, I can tell you that um, what what really hurts, I think, is is seeing how. Public Works, uh, you folks have, have responded to this overwhelming uh, amount of, of trees and yard waste that we're picking up free. I mean, trying to, and that's a fine line. You know, when, we, when you've got something like that, we, we want to make sure that we try to provide some assistance for the citizens that are going through a really tough time. But your point is, is well taken. We we are very aware aware we are very aware of of, um, of how poorly funded that our pay plan is, uh, and it's it's lost ground since about 2009 2010 maybe, and um, and we're, we we understand it we're working on it uh, we're going to have to try to find some way to generate additional revenue streams or we're going to have to, there's only two things you can do you guys know that it's either try to identify another revenue stream so that we can. We can compensate our employees the way we want to compensate them, or we eliminate some expense. Now we're 63 percent uh, personal services, so that means 63 cents out of every dollar we cut is going to be somebody who's providing a service. Now I'm all for reprioritizing the services we do. I'm all for looking at privatization. I'm all for looking at, at efficiencies that can be realized in delivering the services we deliver now. But when we do that, we have to understand that that means if you're going to do away with some services, then we're going to have to, hopefully through attrition, we're going to end up losing jobs as well. So it's something that we're focused on raising revenue, identifying a way to raise revenue. Um, whether you're for or against the tax freeze doesn't matter. The, the fact is, is that it, it, in one respect, it is a constraint. We also have a legislatively imposed nine mil cap. If we came, if council said, you know, we're going to give, we're given a five percent raise for the next three years, and we're going to fund it by increasing the military, we can't do it. We're at the nine mil cap. We cannot raise taxes. The only time we can raise millage rate right now is if we issue debt, and you can't pay raises with the proceeds from debt because that runs out, and you've got to pay the raises every year. So, I, we, I, our raises are like one point two percent, and then you're getting a raise on your uh, your health insurance that every eats it year, up. Every year, the health insurance goes up, but right. our income doesn't. That's right, and we've and seen that happen. You're saying five percent. That's what was said we were supposed to get, but we never got it. Yeah, and no, ma'am, that was. Please don't think we're putting five percent in this year. I don't want you thinking. No, 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 I, that was an example to show you that that, um, that, that we could not fund that. We, we couldn't do it simply because we don't have the resources to be able to identify that revenue stream. Um, I wish I could tell you that we were going to fix it this budget. I can tell you that we're aware of it and that we're focused on it. Uh, and we're going to keep working towards a, a, a situation where we can make an adjustment. You're going to lose a lot of people. Well, we're losing the drivers that have a drivers. CDL. Absolutely. People are. And another thing, yes, we were talking about bringing in high school students. Why don't you educate the adults? That's a great point. And we're looking for ways to do just that. We're, we talk about, in our office, we talk about the big, the big hurdle for us to clear. 
There's so many resources available to adults. There are scholarships available through technical colleges. There are um, grants that are available where people that don't know that they could go Five for two trade. years. That's right. They could go for two years, get placed in in a uh, in, in, in an industry because for the second half of that year. In, they will be a liability because they don't have a teacher teaching them. And then you have the people well, who are working. They're not going to be able to train. No, and, I, and let's be clear, I'm, we're not advocating, and I'm not even sure the young lady was advocating that we bring in high school students and we teach them how to do that job. I think what she was talking about is with the dual enrollment program, that by the time they graduate high school, now they can work, just like Pratt Whitney. Pratt Whitney has hired, I heard, 72 people, 72 young people from, from I think, from Jordan and maybe another school or two, where they've had them come in at half a day during their senior year and do an apprentice program. They don't do the work, but they are on site learning how to do the work while they're in a dual enrollment program. So they're also getting college credit while they're going to the last two years of high school. And then when they graduate, they're going right into a job waiting for them, probably. I, I swear I thought it was 70-something people. I hope that's right. I'm not trying to exaggerate that. But, but I hear what you're saying. No, we're not turning 17-year-olds loose in the machine shop. <laughs> uh, but we are going if we can get 17-year-olds interested in learning about that, then by the time they do graduate from high school, they may have a little bit of skill and a whole lot of want to. They're going to leave because well, they'll, be high, they'll be trying to hire a paying job. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's true. That's why we said we're not going to ask them to teach them. But, um, Anybody else have anything else they want to bring up? Mayor Pro Tem? Mr. Mayor and Mr. City Manager. Ma'am? Can we build a report, come up with a report by the department to let the employees know how much will have to be cut out of non personal services costs? In order for a 3% raise to help us put it into effect. So, can we give a report showing them how much it would cost for a 3% raise? Yeah, but yeah. not just how much it would cost for a 3% raise. The dollars that would have to be cut out of non personal services costs okay. to be able to get that raise. We were looking at that just today, and, and I can tell you that 1% of increase or decrease for that matter, um, is about $1.1 million uh, across the board. That's for, in other words, if, if there's a 1% raise, it, it would be a, a recurring $1.1 million increase to the operating budget um, each year. So we can we can get that out so they know. Um, you know, I, I just, I just want to thank y'all. I really want to thank the department heads that are here because they wanted to listen to you as well. They wanted to make sure they could hear what some of the biggest challenges that you face are. We're going to do this again. This is not a one and done. Um, I, I do want to thank, I mean, I, I do want to thank people that have helped us do this. Uh, Chester's Barbecue, the folks downstairs, they provided those sandwiches for y'all tonight. So y'all, if y'all pass them, please tell them thanks. And Coke, uh, uh, has provided the soft drinks and the water and the unsweetened peach tea. Um, but I just I sincerely want to thank you, you all for, for participating in this. And, and don't let this be the end of it. Um, if you have something that you think I need to know as the mayor, you you are, please feel free to contact me and, and let me know. Because if you, some, there's some great ideas that came out of this this evening and they came from, from you. So we want to keep those coming. Do any department heads have anything they want to say before we're done? All right, well, guys, again, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate what you do every day, I promise you. Thank you.